respected rector of Isidin Pasar, respected director of SPAPA, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to participate in this conference. So the topic that I'm going to discuss in this conference is Balinese Hinduism and Hindu art form. As we know that Hinduism is originally come from India. And as far as the Indian Bali contact is concerned, the archaeological remain indicating that contact between India and Bali was began 2,000 years ago. So exactly in the second mid second century BC. Slide first. Okay, so the Hinduism in Bali as a result of a long process between contact Bali and India, as well as East Java in particular. The beginning of contact between India and Bali was in 2,150 years ago. The archaeological evidence we found in Bali, consisting of several types of Indian portrait, as well as other artifacts from India. So far, Semiran and Pachung and North Eastern Coast of Bali produce the largest Indian portrait in Southeast Asia. So this is the related third we found in Semiran and Pachung. And this kind of third was produced in the south of Bengal site called Arikamedu, which was excavated by Motima Wheeler back in 1946. Not only related where, we also found the Arikamedu type 10 at Samira with peacock decoration on it. Arikamedu type 8 10. This is interesting third that we found at Samiran, and the third with script, which is considered as Karosti or Brahma, Brahmin script. This script was very popular in Gandhara region in Northwest India, and it's related with Dwechi people who trade horse to Southeast Asia. Okay. Apart from the Indian portrait, we also found several glass and stone beads. The glass bead from Samiran have been analyzed chemically, and the raw material are very similar with those from site of Arikamedu in Southeast Asia, in South India, sorry. One interesting bead recently discovered at Samiran, which is considered as the Roman beads. So the appearance of Roman bead, Roman glass bead in Samiran, indicating that Bali has been involved in long distance trade, involving India, Mediterranean, as well as other site, other region in Southeast Asia and also China. Apart from the archaeological evidence, the Indian texts such as Ramayana, dated prior to AD 200, also mentioned several products from Indonesia, such as garu wood and sandal wood from eastern part of Indonesia. The Raguamsa of Kalidasa, dated from 400 AD, also mentioned clove. As far as clove is concerned, clove only native trees which grow in the five islands of Moluccas, Ternate, Tidore, Machan, Makian. The classical text during the Roman Empire also indicating that Pliny already knew about the cloak. So again, as I mentioned before, cloak only grow in the Moluccas area, in the eastern part of Indonesia. So at that time, Southeast Asia and Indonesia in particular was involved 
in long distance trade connecting the Southeast Asian country, South Asia, India, and Mediterranean as well. Spices was the main commodity was traded at that time. This is map also indicating how cinnamon and clove traded from Southeast Asia to India and to Mediterranean area. Okay, so how was the Balinese society at the time during the beginning of contact between India and Bali? It seemed to me archaeologically indicating that rank or stratified society have already occurred in Bali at the beginning of contact between Bali and India. Social stratification at that time were, were represented by mortuary practice and burial good. Indian contact may have stimulated the appearance of Hinduism and Buddhism in Bali in the late 9th century AD. So this is the archaeological discovery in Bali at a site called Manikliu in Kintamani region. Here we can see there are three types of burial. The first one, the The burial was carried out on the sarcophagi, and the middle one is burial with a bronze drum, and the third one is burial without sarcophagi or without a burial seas. So, it, by looking at this kind of archaeological evidence, I assume that those people who buried in the drum, bronze drum, must be having a high rank in society. As we know that there is no raw material for copper or tin occur in Bali. So those people who has big bronze drum, like the Pejeng one, which is almost two meter high, and it's very much prestigious material in the society. So by looking at the burial system, as I mentioned before, Balinese society, pre-Hindu period, during the beginning of contact between Bali and India, was already stratified. And it seemed to me there was as many contact between India and Bali. The most important one to me in relation with the appearance of Hinduism in Bali was began in 800 AD during the Borobudur period. So at that time, it seemed to me there was a second migration, a second wave of contacts between India and Bali. And we found in Bali several stone inscription with Sanskrit and Palawa script. And also there are many hundred of clay stupa with Buddhism mantras we found in Bali. So that period, around 200, uh, sorry, 800 ED, there was a second wave of contact between India and Bali where the Hinduism or Buddhism also spread to the island. The inscriptional data, such as the clay stupa we found in Bali contained Ye Dharma formula, the Buddhist mantras, which were discovered at Pejang in Central Bali. The stupa contained tiny seal and Yani Buddha and dated from 800 AD. One important thing I should notice that the Balinese inscription dated from 10 up to 11th century mentioned several places named in India, such as Waranasi, Nalanda and Amarawati. Waranasi is the place where Buddhists give a priest. And Nalanda, I think, is the oldest university so far we know. And the king of Balaputra Dewa from Indonesia, he built the metery at Nalanda by 860. So the Balinese people at the at 11th century, they already knew about the place. So maybe, I guess, some Balinese people, maybe they went to India 
at the time to learn, study about Buddhism. Okay, the appearance of Dharanis and Mantras, as well as the places named such as Varanasi, Nalanda, and Amaravati, suggest that Bali is an integral part of ancient Buddhist world. This is the clay stupa that we found so far in Bali. Hundreds of this kind of clay stupa we found. And inside of the stupa, we found the Buddhist mantra, as well as the Dhyani Buddha figure, and the stupa as well. This is very interesting find at the temple of Pagulingan at Tampak Siring, just across the presidential palace, Tampak Siring. And the stupa contain Dharani, so the gold inscription with uh, Buddhist mantras. And then last year, when I visit Ratnagiri in India, in the Odisha state in South India, I found similar stupa, hundreds of stupa like this with the Dhyani Buddha inside at Ratnagiri in Odisha state in India. So by looking at this kind of stupa, I believe there was a contact, could be direct contact between India and Bali around 800 AD when Buddhism was spread to all of Southeast Asia, including Bali. We found also this kind of relief in the Patanuri Plain, where we got the relief of Stupa, Chatrawali. Okay, apart from the relationship with India, Bali has a close relationship with East Java. There was a politically and culturally relationship between Bali and East Java. Around 11th century ED, the prince of Udayana, king of Bali at the time, married a princess from East Java called Gunapriya Dharmapatni or Mahendradatta. Through this marriage, they have three sons. The first one, Erlanga, second Marakata, and the third is Anawungsu. Erlanga becoming king in East Java to represent his father-in-law. And at that time, the relationship between East Java and Bali was very close because both islands was governed by the same family. So there was a cultural similarities, particularly in Hinduism, and also political close relationship between both islands. Okay, so East Java was reigned by Erlanga, the eldest son, and Bali was ruled by Marakata and his youngest brother, Anak Wongsu. Apart from political aspect, there were also cultural similarities between Bali and East Java during the 11th century AD. The similarities were represented by the statues or image of the betting place, the betting place at Belahan in East Java and Gua Gajah in Bali. It is also found that the Kadiri Quadrat script were utilized in Bali at that time. This is the image from Blahan in East Java. The water come out from the breast, which is very similar with from East Java, from the one that we found at Gua Gajah. So similar style, all the water come from the body of the image. Okay, and in Bali, just recently discovered an uh, image of Wisnu from Langahan in Kintamani region. In East Java, we have a very famous image of Erlanga, the king of East Java, which is father from Bali and Elanga riding Garuda, Garuda Wisnu Kanchana. 
This is the image of Durga from Kutri, which is representing Erlanga Madas or Gunapriya Dharma Patni, Udayana White. So he was constructed in the Durga image, which is now still preserved at the Pura Dharma Kutri at Gianyar. And we also found a lot of Hindu statue, which is still kept at the Temple of Penataran Sasi in Pejeng. And I believe Pejeng was the center of Hinduism in Bali back in 9 up to 14th century before Bali was conquered by the Majapahit Kingdom. Okay. Trimurti image in the center, which is still kept at the Temple of Panataran Sasi in Pejeng. Double image from East Japa. You see here, there is not attribute or defined attribute from this image. This image is, to me, and also many scholars believe, is representing the image of ancestra, the dead people like a portrait, something like that. In Bali, we also found that kind of image at Penataran, uh, at Penulisan Temple. And again, here we can see any attribute of divine of this statue, just a portrait of the dead people. That is very specific to me in Bali, that uh, people create the image without indicating a attribute of a divine God. Okay, the relationship between Bali and East Java is not smoothly. As I mentioned before, during 11th to 12th century, there was a close relationship between Bali and East Java, politically and culturally, but this relationship up and down, starting from 13th up to 14th century. In the 13th century, Bali was attacked by King Kartanegara, King of Singasari and East Java, and Bali at the time was governed by the Kebo Farut, representing East Java authority in Bali. And then the second attack by East Java to Bali was in 1343, when the King of Majapahit under General Gajah Mada, who attacked Bali, and Bali was colonized by Majapahit in the mid 14th century. However, in terms of cultural relationship, the text of Nagara Kartagama mentioned that there are two places in Bali that follow the costume in Java. This place are uh, Badahulu and Lua Gajah. So as I mentioned before, although politically there was a riot conflict between East Java and Bali, but culturally, Bali at the time still following the tradition in East Java. This kind of thing we can see from the uh, temple construction in Bali, which are very similar with those found in East Java, particularly at the Penataran Temple. The Penataran Temple in East Java from the 14th century looked to me as the prototype of the Balinese Temple now. Okay. At Trawulan, we also found the bas relief, which is look like the split gate, the temple gate in Bali today. So we can say that East Java is a kind of a source of the prototype of the Balinese temple construction today. This is the layout of Balinese temple. We can see the Balinese temple normally divided into three parts. The outer yard, Jabal, the middle yard, Jabal Tengah, and the inner yard. The inner yard is considered as the most sacred one 
sacred place for the Balinese temple. So at the inner yard, we found a lot of shrine, like Meru, the storage building with many ropes, symbolizing the mountain, the place of the god. And most the sacred ceremony normally take place at the Jeroan, or at the inner yard of the temple, the most sacred place. In the contemporary Balinese art, so there are not much image or statue, Hindu statue we found, but what we found is the symbol, the weapon, the power of the Balinese god, what it is now called as Nawasanga, the nine cardinal point of the god in Bali. The first one is Iswara in east with white color. Its weapon is Bajra. Silabic is Sang. The temple is Empuya in East Bali. Maheswara, southeast, color is pink, weapon is dupa, and the temple is Andakasa. Brahma, south, or cloud, color is red, the weapon is Gada, the temple is Gualawa. Rudra, southwest, color is orange, weapon Moksala, and the temple is Uluwatu. Good place, beautiful place there. So you should go there to Uluwatu in Badung Regency. Mahadewa in the west, color is yellow. Weapon Nagapasa and the temple Batukaru in northwest of Bali. Sankara, northwest, green. The weapon of Kusa, the temple is Bukit Pengelengan. Wisnu is north. Color is black. The weapon is chakra or wheel. The temple is Batur temple. Sambu, northeast. Color is blue. The weapon is Trisula. And the temple is Besake in the Besake complex temple. Siwa is the center. Color is mixture. Yeah? Weapon is Padma. And the temple is Besake. The weapon is just like this. Okay, now I come to the Balinese ritual and performing art. The Balinese ritual can be classified into five categories, what we call it panchayatnya. Namely, dewayatnya, right for the gods and its manifestation. Resiyatnya, right for the praise. Pitrayatnya, right for the ancestor. Manusayatnya, right for the passage of life cycle ceremony because uh, manusayatnya is very important in Bali. When the baby born, we have a ceremony right for that. When the baby three month old, six month, when they got adult, we got tooth filing ceremony and they get married until die. All this life cycle, we perform ceremony. And the last ceremony, what we call it, butayatnya, the ride for underworld or diamond or bad spirit. So Balinese people, they tend to maintain balance between the good and the bad. So the ceremony, not only for the God, but also for the underworld, what we call it, the butayatnya, to make it balance, harmony between upper world and underworld. So in Bali, Every major ceremony consisting of five components, what we call it Banten, the offering, like what we saw just a few minutes ago. There is an offering, there is an incantation, the mantras, the magic formula led by the priest, song, what we call it Kidung, music, gamelan, and dance, or eagle eagleland. So there are five components normally accompanied the ceremony in Bali, the offering, the mantras, the song, 
the music, the dance, all together. And as far as the dance in Bali is concerned, the Balinese divided the dance into three categories, what we call it Wali, the sacred one, Babali, semi-sacred, and Bali Balihan, the entertainment. The Wali dance consisting of rejang, which is normally performed during the temple ceremony, Sangyang, the trance dance, Baris also performed during the temple ceremony. The semi-sacred one, Babali, the dance art include Wayang, Topeng, the mask dance, Gambuh as well, and performed during the temple festival or ceremony, cremation. And the third one, what we call it Bali Balihan, or refer to dance conceived for entertainment, including Janger, Legong, and Joget. The Balinese people is quite lucky because recently, in 2015, nine Balinese dance have been accepted as intangible world heritage list by UNESCO. Those then include Sangyang, Baris, and Rejang, which consider as the sacred one, the Wali dance. Wayang Wong, Topeng Sidakarya, and Gamu is the Babali one. So its category was represented by three kind of dance, semi secret dance. Barong, Legong Kraton, and Jogen as Bali Balihan are also accepted by UNESCO as world heritage intangible world heritage list. This is the Sangyang, the Wali one, the trans dance. Young, two young lady normally perform to dance and there is a ceremony, small offering until they got trans. The Baris one, this warrior dance is considered as the Wali. Rajang, This is Wayang Wong, the semi-sacred dance. Topeng, the mask dance. Topeng Siddhakarya, representing that the ceremony is successful. Siddha Karya, yeah. Okay, the Gamu one. This is considered as the source of Balinese dance. Barong, yeah, Legong, and Bumbum, Joget Bumbum, as the Bali Balihan or entertainment. Okay, now I would like to inform you a little bit on Hindu Bali and multiculturalism. There are several cultural norms and values which supported multiculturalism in Bali. Those including Tatwa Masi, which is literally mean, that is you, which means you are as the same as me. So if you hurt somebody else, this means that you hurt yourself. So Tatwa Masi, you as me. Empathy, something like that. The second value or philosophy of the Balinese people is what we call it Tri Hita Karana. Tri is mean three, Hita is happiness, Wellness and karana is the cause. There are three things that cause human happiness, wellness. And there is also a kind of norm, what we call it nyama braya. Nyama braya literally means it's a relative, sibling. So we treat other people as our relative. So we tolerant to other people. So that value, that cultural norm, I think also create some multiculturalism in Hindu Balinese. So Trihita Karana, that's mean three things that cause happiness or prosperity. Those include parhyangan, harmony and balance between human and God. Vertically, sorry. Pawongan, harmony and balance with other human. 
and Palamahan, harmony and balance with the environment. So that's the essence of Trihita Karana, three things that cause the happiness. In practical thing, we can see some example how the Balinese people interact with fellow Muslim and also with Chinese Confucian. The Muslim community also take part during the temple festival, such as the temple festival at Pura Langar in Bangli and Pura Pusah Marita at Kubu Karangasem. And one interesting thing, there are several Klenteng or Chinese, Chinese Confucian shrine were built in Balinese temple, including the biggest temple, the modest temple at Besaku. Batur and other temple in Bali as well. In addition, during my research in three villages in Bali at Charangsari, Baturiti and Padangbai, I found very interesting thing that each family, each Chinese family at those three villages, they have two buildings, two shrines. The one what we call it Sangha Kemulan, the Hindu Balinese temple of origin, and secondly, they have also Koncho in his house. So one Chinese family, what I found in those three villages, they have two shrines, okay? This is the Pura Langar at Bunutan, Bunutin in Bangli. During the temple festival, Muslim community and Hindu community also take part at that temple. Here we can see a very interesting figure that young girl from the Muslim family, they also take part during the Balinese Hindu temple festival. They take holy water like the, what the Balinese people do. This is the Klenteng at Batur temple. So we can see here the Chinese Confucian they pray at the Balinese temple, and also the, the Hindu Balinese people also pray at the shrine. This is the shrine of Subanat at the Sake. Last time, last month, I went there, I took photograph, and I saw that very mixed people there. The Chinese, the Hindu Balinese, they pray together. So how harmony the world people do like that. This is the Chinese people at the Balinkang temple, also praying like the Hindu Balinese people. Yeah, as I mentioned before, each family, each Chinese family at the three villages that I've been conducting research recently, they have both shrine. On the left, they have the Hindu Sangah Kemulan, Hindu temple of origin. And on the other side, they have a concho as well. So each family, they have two shrines, Hindu Balinese and their own shrine. So at the end, I would like to conclude my speech that Hinduism in Bali is a result of long-term process of contact between Bali and India, maybe direct contact, as well as contact with East Java. Hindu art in Bali was inspired by Indian and East Japanese ideology. However, local development also occurred in Bali. Hindu Balinese ceremony normally com accompanied by five elements, include mantras, offering, dance, song, and music. And in daily practice, Hinduism in Bali also support multiculturalism. I think that's all. Thank you for your interpret. Thank you very much, Professor Adikar. Now we are going to take uh, questions or comments from the floor. Uh, thank you very much. We know from, uh, we learned a lot of things from your presentation. I have a question that you just mentioned that there is a temple, Pura Langar, in Bangli. Yes. So 
as I am the part of the Bengal, so there is any connection, this Bangli and the Pura, because uh, in Odisha we have Puri, the temple of Puri and the uh, very famous place, Puri. And Bangli is, is it come from Bengal or like that? Something <laughs> relation is there? Yeah. There is no relation. Uh, yes, uh, the Pura Langar at Bangli is very interesting one. According to the history, the Pura Langar was built by the king of Bangli. Mm -hmm. And then at that time, he also reigned East Java. Okay. So some Muslim people mm. build the temple in cooperation with the Balinese people. So up till now, the, the Muslim people, they still have praying, they have wudu to wash their feet, things okay. on them. And they also, what do you call it? During the Ramadan holiday, mm. they, they slaughter a buffalo and they spread the, the meat to the other people at that area. So it's quite good, you know. Oh, good. So it means there's a mixed culture yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Because, okay. as I said, the Pura Langar, the, the Muslim shrine, was initiated by the king of Bangli. Okay. Yeah, mm. it, it was a, he was a Hindu, but he accommodated the Muslim people as well. Okay, as well, you just, uh, I saw many things coming from the West Bengal. Uh -huh. you, so maybe there is a relation, and so I was very much interested to yeah. know. I'm not so sure whether Bangli is derived from Bengal. Okay, okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. yes. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Uh, I would like to know mainly what are the major differences between Hinduism in Bali and Hinduism in India or Nepal. And secondly, I also noticed that um, uh, most Hindus in India, they don't take beef. What about mm -hmm. the Hindus in Bali? Mm -hmm. Are there any restrictions? Thank you. Yeah, there are, I think there are some differences between Hinduism in India and in Bali as well. As I mentioned before, there are some local development also going on in Bali because Bali before the Hindu came to Bali, we have also cultural acculturation with what we call it the Austronesian speaking people. The most important one for the pre-Hindu cult, Hindu tradition, which is still survived up till now in Bali, is the ancestral worship. So as I saw in the slide, the temple of origin, that's representing how the Balinese people, they pray, they respect their ancestors. So this philosophy, this tradition was mixed with the Hinduism, Hindu philosophy. So there are some local element, pray Hindu, come, still survive, still exist, that, you know, mixed with the Hindu ideology, Hindu, Hindu philosophy, something like that. And also, some Balinese inscription, like Trunyan, like the Batur area inscription, that's mentioned about what we call it Batara Datonta, which is the megalithic statue, the pre-Hindu statue. They still, you know, look after, they maintain, they make a ceremony for that. And recently, I mean, if you go to Besake, for instance, the shrine name at Besake, the god that, I mean, dedicated to the shrine, is not Hindu god. It's local name, like Ratu Majemu, which is very local one. Not Indra, not Vishnu, something like that. So it's kind of local development going on in Bali. And then there are, yeah, some iconographic also some inspired by the Hindu iconography, but 
as I, meant, as I saw before, there's a portrait statue of the dead people, of the ancestors, without Hindu attribute, something like that. So that, to me, is a, a kind of local development. You know? And maybe also another aspect, something different between Indian and Balinese Hinduism. Regarding the beef, yeah, some Balinese, Hindu Balinese people, they don't eat beef, but myself, I eat it. <laughs> it depends, you know, personally. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kuchinan. Uh, thank you so much. It was a very comprehensive presentation. Um, I have a few questions, actually, mm -hmm. not one. Um, first question is why there is not much reference to Durga worship mm -hmm. uh, as uh, there is more emphasis on Shiva. Uh, um, little reference to Vishnu. Uh, then uh, my next question is on um, the earliest references to temple architectural complex. Uh, how old can it go back to? Um, and in your um, final uh, present, I mean, fi uh, final section of your presentation, you were mentioning a lot of inf uh, references to East Java mm -hmm. uh, as the source for temple architecture. So, is there any other source that comes directly from uh, South India? Because when we study Sri Vijaya, mm -hmm. uh, we do get references to one, the Bengal um, uh, references from uh, of the Pala period. And then the next uh, a wave of influence or uh, interaction is from the Chola period. So is there any uh, interaction through the Bengal, uh, Bay of Bengal and all the way up to the Coromandel coast? And also regarding textile, which of course uh, I'm interested, uh, there is also the double ikat, uh, which is also practiced in Gujarat and Andhra Pradesh. So is there any connections that also can go to uh, Gujarat uh, side. Sorry, I, I have too many questions. Okay. Thank you. The first question is regarding the Durga worship in Bali is very rare. I saw you one image of Durga statue at Pura Dharma Kutri, which is representing the Guna Priya Dharma Patni, the mother of Erlanga. And when I went I did some research in Pupuan at Galalang. I found one block of stone and consisting of four images, the family of Siwa. There was a Siwa, Mahadeva, Ganesh, Durga, and Mahaguru in the same block. Like the one, if we compare with the Prambanan, something like that. That's only one I found so far in Bali. Very small, but it's very important one. That was at Tegalalang, Philip, when I did my research back in five, ten years ago. So you are right that uh, Durga is very rare in Bali. But what I found in Inu Balinese practice today, when people doing a cremation, ngaben, cremation in Bali, particularly for the high nobility, like a priest, they're doing titi mama, the kind of uh, ceremony related with Durga, I think. Because during the ceremony, they slot a buffalo or the cow and they put the skin of the animal and people walk through it. That remind me with Durga Mahisa Suramardini. The, the ceremony still being practiced by the Balinese people even today during the cremation ceremony. They're doing a big ceremony for the Buddha, for the underworld, what we call it Titi Mama like a bridge connecting this world to upper world. And that's remind me with the Durga Mahisa Suramartini, when Durga killed Mahisa. So it's very similar, but 
the Balinese people might, sorry, <laughs> maybe they don't understand what the meaning of that kind of ceremony. It's very much related with Durga Mahesa Suramati to me. But no image, not very much statue for the Durga, but the practice is still going on today in Bali. Okay? The, yeah, the source of temple construction. When I read the inscription of Manik, uh, sorry, Manukkaya related with Tirta Hampul, and the inscription was mentioned, Masamhain Tirta di Air Ampul. Tirta must be Indian word. Yeah? And I read the Stella Krambis book on Hindu architecture, something like that. The shrine or the temple should be built close to the Tita, close to the water. And Tita Ampul is exactly like that. So to me, the Balinese people during the mid 10th century, they are already adopting that kind of concept, the concept of Tita, the concept of spring, the holy water. And if you look at all the archaeological remains along the Pakrisan and Pat Patanu rivers, all are built close to the spring. So that's to me is, yeah, they must know about the Indian source when they build that kind of shrine, you know. I think that's answer. And the last question about textile. Yeah, we do still have at Tenganan Pa Gringsingan, double ikat gringsing. So this is the Indian style. And last time when I did, when I did research there, the motif is an elephant. So there is no elephant in Bali, but they keep the elephant motif from the gringsing, from the double ikat one. So maybe it's a, come from Indian one. And we did some DNA analysis on the human teeth at Pachu and indicating there was a dominant eye chromosome from India. Cross married between the Indian and the local people back in first century ED. Maybe already occurred in Bali. Thank you. Professor Ardika, thank you very much. Yeah. As you mentioned that we have several philosophy in Bali, you call that Tatwa uh, Asi, Trihita Karana, and also Monyamo Braya. Would you explain to the audience that who, where, and how uh, those philosophy is implemented uh, in in the society in in Bali society. As my opinion that three hitakrana has been implemented in uh, suba system in Bali. Maybe. Tomorrow afternoon, uh, we are going to see the sewer system in that Pasar City. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, my colleague, Professor Windia. How Balinese people de implemented Trihitakarana in their daily life? As I saw you in the slide, there are a lot of examples how Balinese people with other people, they interaction, interrelated like the ceremony at Pura Langar, ceremony at Batur and other temple that not only the Hindu people, but the Chinese, the Muslim people also take part during this ceremony. And in relation with Trihita Karana, I did my research on Tamanayun and Tampak Siring two years ago. The both temples have already been 
accepted by UNESCO at World Heritage List, I would like to try to, to look at how Tehaka was implemented in the temple as tourist attraction. So what I found, tourism, oh, I mean tourists, they don't understand three Hitakarana. Almost 80% the tourists who visit Taman Ayun and Tirta Ampul, they don't understand three Hitakarana because there is no much information has been produced by the government, by the tourist industry to make tourists understand about three Hitakarana. Only the Balinese tourists, they understand three Hitakarana. So what I found at Tamanayun, for instance, the tourists are allowed to go to the temple without wearing Balinese costume. They use sword, yeah, whatever they want. They just let them go. But this is at the temple. We do have regulation concerning how tourists go to the temple. But in reality, at Tamanayun, no. So tourists just go in, they don't wearing sarung, they don't wearing, wearing salt, and so on. At Tirta Empul is the other side. They wearing Balinese costume, but they freely go to the inner yard, the most sacred part of the temple. They doing selfie and <laughs> the area for the ceremony just very small. So to me, the implementation of three hitakarana in Balinese temple as a tourist attraction is should be, you know, improved. The aspect of pawongan, the relationship between people and other people at the temple, at both temple, also not good. As world heritage site, for instance, Tamanayun, there is no booklet, there is no guidance books written in English. It's only in Bahasa Indonesia. It's said to me. And I asked the manager, why you don't have any English guidance books? He said, this temple is very well known. We don't need to promote, oh my God. So that's going on in daily life. So Trihita Karana is good concept, it's philosophy, but it is very difficult to implement it in the daily life. Sorry to that. Thank you, Pat. So um, maybe one last question, okay? Because we have, thank you. Thank you so much for your enlightening talk. Um, I have a question about this three hita karna. Is this largely symbolism? That means it's conceptual in the mind, or is it ritual where there's some sort of agency? Then actually you said the gods are in harmony with human beings. How does one feel that? Is it conceptual or is it physical engagement which will create some sort of release uh, in some sort of tension inside the devotee that would release into happiness? Uh, sorry, I'm tainting my question like a doctor. Uh, so the question was, is it symbolic where, is, where the, the aha or the eureka happens in the mind or is it felt in the body? as though there was an external agency, I mean, what we call God, uh, possessing us or transforming us. Yeah, Sorry for this question. Just like a philosophy is in your mind. But as I said before, it is very difficult. We implement it in our life. So it is philosophically. 
You mean the three Hitakaran? Yeah. Yeah. And what about, how, but with the, I'm more interested in, you know, you take part in the ritual. Mm -hmm. At some point, the devotee is in some sort of space where an external agency, which is God, mm -hmm. it, through that agency enters the devotee in some form, okay? Uh, so my question was, is, I mean, uh, is the devotee still outside the ritual or inside the ritual? Yeah, we can say inside the, the religion as well. As I mentioned before, the, the Balinese is keeping the ballot in terms of ritual. Yeah? Balinese people, they offer something, the offering to the God, and also to the underworld, to the Buddha. So that's mean to me how the Balinese people, by ritual, by doing some ritual ceremony, they try to keep the balance between the upper one. Oh. <laughs> How does one read the feedback? The uh, feedback, you mean? From uh, that the gods have received the request or the ritual and they are pleased and they're sending you some message. Is there any? Oh, it's very difficult, yeah? <laughs> Maybe we take up. Talk later on, okay? We discuss about that. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, please join me in giving him a round of applause again for this exceptional speech.